Man who was having seizure while being beaten by police has his police assault charges dropped. Edmonton Police Chief went to a dinosaur derby fundraiser for the UCP. Jameson Vitamins lab workers are on strike. Coast Mountain and QP4500 accept mediator's report. Strike may be over. Jury finds Sammy Yetim's death a murder. And union organizing in Alabama car plants hits critical step. Good morning. It's Friday, February 2nd. The groundhog did not see his shadow because none of us have seen the sun in a month. I'm Nora, and here are your headlines. First, charges have been dropped against a Hamilton man who... No, wait. How do I how do I tell this story with maximum impact? Hmm. Charges were dropped over an encounter that Marcus Charles had with Hamilton police. They handcuffed him, held him down, and tased him, and arrested him and charged him with two counts of assault and one count of assault against a police officer, all while Charles was having a seizure. At the time, he was standing outside of a Canadian tire, which is where he works. The police were called by his friends because they were worried about the seizure. This was back in October 2022. Joanna Petropoulos from CHCH quotes Charles saying this, quote, I feel like a million bucks, man. I'm so happy. Unsurprisingly, the Canadian Epilepsy Alliance is calling on police to do mandatory training, which we all know will be useless, but I guess you got to call for it. I get it. Trevor Gordon from the group points out that had police not even shown up, Charles would have been better off. Police defended their actions by saying they did what they thought they had to do given the circumstances, which was that a black man was having a medical crisis and they therefore held him to the ground, tased him, and then arrested him for assaulting them. You can't reform that, folks. Next, news from Duncan Kinney at the Progress Report. And you know what? I'm just going to read it how Kinney wrote it. Quote, on August 14th, 2020, Edmonton Police Chief Dale McPhee attended the first annual United Conservative Party Derby, a political fundraiser where MLAs dress up in T-Rex costumes and race each other on a horse track outside of Lancome. The partisan activity is troubling, says one researcher and activist from Edmonton, but consistent with the chief's record as a, quote, conservative through and through, unquote. I mean, just imagine this. These clowns, and they're already clowns, right? They get dressed up in dinosaur suits in the summer of 2020, so like the thick of the pandemic, and race each other, and people paid to be there, okay? 19 MLAs from the UCP were in attendance, including Jason Kenney, who was the premier. Tickets ranged in cost from $100 to $3,000 to have access to something called the Ralph Klein VIP suite. No word on whether or not you also get insulted and have change thrown at you when you're inside that suite. Yellowhead Institute Research Fellow Rob Houle told Kinney this, quote, Chief McPhee going to a UCP fundraiser is definitely problematic from a transparency perspective. And when you look at the relationship between marginalized communities and this UCP government and the direction they're heading, unquote. Next, Jameson lab workers in Windsor, Ontario, have walked out of the job on strike. Yep, Jameson like the vitamins. They are against management's attempt to give them a four-year contract, and they want better benefits, wages, and job security. There are 317 workers, and they manufacture, package, and warehouse vitamins, which, by the way, why did you folks change the consistency of the gummy vitamin Ds? Those were my favorite, and now they're not so much my favorite anymore, but I still get them anyway. Now, I don't see any news on this yet. All I saw was a press release from their local Unifor 195. But when I looked, I did see that these same workers were on strike in 2017. In fact, a proposal brought by the union's bargaining committee was rejected by the members back in 2017. The union had agreed to workers receiving a lump sum payment of just over $1,000 and two fifty cent pay increases over two years on an average salary of $22 per hour. The workers, the members, they rejected that. Now, the Windsor Star noted back in 2017 that union busting tactics back in 2017 had decimated the union. They had 220 workers as members of Local 195. That was down from 470 workers who were employees there. 
Well, what happened? Well, the Canadian company, which was operated in Windsor from 1922 and onwards, was bought by a U.S. private equity firm called CCMP Capital Advisors. Now, in 2023, it's good to see the number of workers in the union be back up to 317. Still a little ways to go to get that 440 workers back in the union, if those jobs still exist, but still better than the 220 where they were in 2017. Next, Coast Mountain and QP 4500 have accepted recommendations of a mediator named Vince Reddy, quote, likely averting another strike, unquote. This is how it's written by Stephanie Ipp and Joseph Ruddle in the Vancouver Sun. There have not been any more strike actions since last week when workers went out for two days. The QP local represents 180 workers, which is a small group of transit operators in Vancouver, but uniform members who were also transit operators respected picket lines, making the impact of the strike much bigger. The workers still need to approve the deal. The mediator was appointed after those two days of strike. And a bit of last news for Canada here before we move south. Sammy Yatim's death has been declared a homicide. Yatim was murdered by a Toronto police officer on a Toronto streetcar while he held a small knife in 2013. He was just 18 years old. The case shocked Toronto and did lead to the shooter, James Forcillo, to leave policing and be charged. Now, you might be wondering, why now? Why is this coming out now? Well, that's how backed up coroner inquiries are in Ontario. The jury for the inquiry made 63 recommendations about how to make police less violent and to give support to families whose loved ones are killed by police. I just want to say again, reports, recommendations, guys, they cannot be reformed. You cannot, we can't keep making recommendations. What is the point of this? It is a waste of public resources. Just defund the police. Anyway, Forsilla was found not guilty in 2016 of second-degree murder, but he was found guilty of attempted murder. That's because he fired two volleys of shots at Yatim, and it was found that they couldn't conclude that he intended to murder him with the first volley of shots, but the second volley of shots was enough to get that attempted murder charge. As a result, he served six and a half years and has been on full parole since 2020, reports Muriel Dresma for CBC News. And finally, Hyundai workers in Montgomery, Alabama have launched a union drive. They've already hit the threshold needed to hold an election, which is what Americans call a unionization vote. They are being organized by the United Auto Workers, and they have a policy internally to not go to a union election until 70% of the workers sign union cards, even though that threshold of 30% is all that's needed to trigger an election. Workers complain about low wages and dangerous working conditions, including being pushed back to work too soon after a workplace injury. The company responded to say that the plant is, quote, among the safest, unquote, in the U.S., and that they will be giving the workers a 25% wage increase by 2028. Some workers have already received a one-year pay increase of 14%. This is UAW's second Alabama plant drive this year already, reports the Alabama Reflector. They are also trying to unionize the Mercedes-Benz plant in Vance. The state of Alabama has worked very hard to get auto companies to operate there. Hyundai was given $252.8 million to operate there, including public works improvements and tax abatements. Governor Kay Ivey and other anti-union business people have tried to argue that unions aren't an Alabama thing, more of an out-of-state thing. Though it is the most organized state in the South, with brace for it, a whopping 7.5% of workers being unionized. That was an increase of 7,000 workers in the last year, though. So things are looking pretty good for the labor movement in Alabama. Another 8.6% of the workforce in that state are represented by unions, though not members of a union, because it's a right to work state. That means that you can be covered by a union, a union has to represent you, but you don't actually have to be a member, aka you don't actually have to pay dues to it. Remember that right to work laws have their roots in racist policies, the racist belief that white workers and black workers should not be in the same organization together. It goes back to the 1940s and has ensured that workers, especially in the South, but also in other right to work states, remain mostly unorganized. Auto workers in Alabama make an average of $65,000 per year. Their real wages declined by 11% between 2002 and 2019. 
Their wages also lag behind national auto workers' salaries, and black, Hispanic, and women workers are paid, quote unquote, substantially less. There's no doubt that the workers who make cars in Alabama are also looking at the very successful strike actions that the UAW coordinated at the big three auto workers, winning huge salary increases. You can't buy publicity like that. And so good luck to the workers in Alabama who very well might form new unions. Those are your headlines for Friday, February 2nd. Ah, it's Friday, everybody. I hope you are excited to hit Friday as I am, even though I have nothing planned at all. Mm, Sleeping in, though, that's going to feel good. I hope you have a chance to do something your equivalent of sleeping in if that's not something you do. You are listening to this podcast at sandyandnora.com on the Real News Network podcast feed or anywhere you get your podcasts. I will talk to you on Monday once we are really, really, really into this month of February.